Hello and welcome to Friday's Afternoon Plus. As the Falkland crisis lurches from bad to worse, the public debate about the rights and wrongs of the affair continues. At the centre of the stage this last week or so has been the BBC. Now, the BBC is used to flack. It's had enough of it over its uh, Northern Ireland coverage, for example. But this time, the criticism has been about patriotism. Do objectivity and patriotism go hand in hand? Should the BBC, not to mention ITN and the press, actively transmit the British government's view to the exclusion of Argentina's? So we come to the debate about propaganda. Propaganda is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the propagation of a particular doctrine or practice. More commonly, it's known as the uh, manipulation of truth for political means. It happened on both sides during the Second World War, but should it happen now? Well, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the BBC's external services, which broadcast to the world from London, often threatened by government cuts, but now taking on a new public importance, the external services operate around the clock. Their coverage of the Falklands issue is regarded here as impeccable and unbiased. So the criticisms I mentioned earlier have largely been addressed to the BBC's domestic services and its television in particular. Well, what are the BBC's external services and how do they operate? We've been observing them and here is our filmed report. This is London. And this is Bush House in central London, headquarters of the BBC's external services. 16 hours, Greenwich Mean Time. Here in London, Here's the BBC London with the Deutschsprachigen Dienst. The BBC's World Service in English broadcasts around the clock. In addition, the British point of view is heard throughout the world in 37 other languages. Our primary purpose is, and it's almost a sort of pursued with messianic zeal within this building, is to broadcast the news, comment, current affairs and all our other programs with as much objectivity and impartiality as we can. It's estimated that more than a hundred million listeners tune into the BBC's overseas broadcasts at least once a week. And in times of crisis, there's a dramatic increase. So it's accepted that the corporation's international influence is immeasurable. London. We are serving the whole of the world. Our purpose is to broadcast in the national interest. Now, we interpret that as meaning that we should broadcast in, the way, in such a way that we reflect all opinion in this country, not just government opinion. When I was still in Russia, I was listening first of all news and then review of the British press and some comments on, on the BBC Russian service, uh, some specific programs on certain events. The Soviets reckon officially that something like 40 million people listen to it. So it's a huge audience, much bigger than any of it has here. This is London Calling. The, British Empire, through the, Empire the origins of the external services began in 1932 with the then Empire Service. With technical advances, it expanded rapidly, so that by the outbreak of World War II, it had already established its international authority. By the end of the war, it had become the largest external broadcasting service in the world, and many people in occupied countries had come to think of the BBC as the voice of freedom. Well, 
il n'y a pas un enfant. This is the Pacific Service from London sending you all greetings and wishing the best of luck to those of you listening who are serving in our armed forces on sea, land or in the air, and in the Merchant Navy. This is London calling the Falkland Islands on 15.40 and 11.82 megahertz in the 19 and 25 meter bands. Hello again everybody, it's Kathleen Treesmond here tonight in the studio in London. And once again we have a paper mountain and a tape mountain of messages to catch up with. But before that, we have a special message for you from the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Francis Pym. Good evening. It is some time now since I spoke to you on the radio. And I'm doing so now because there's just been a very important development, which I want you to know of straight away. The BBC's Polish service. Bije Big Ben, godzina 15 w Anglii, 16 w Polsce. Tu mówi Londyn. Rozpoczynamy piątą audycję radia BBC na falach krótkich. Until December of last year, we had three hours daily on the air. Since uh, 23rd of uh, December, uh, we've uh, extended our broadcast by 45 minutes daily. The Polish service started broadcasting in Polish to Poland only a few days after the beginning of Second World War, on 7th of September 1939 to be specific, uh, which means we've been on the air uh, constantly for a period of 43 years now. What's in it? Well, news bulletins, of course, by far the most popular thing we do. Uh, we broadcast about Britain, we broadcast about the world, about politics, about economics, about social developments, about technology, about arts, about theater. The whole gamut, the whole variety of life is reflected, in fact, in our programs. But is it propaganda? It is not propaganda, it is anything but propaganda, because credibility is the only weapon we've got. The decision concerning what we broadcast is actually made in this building, because we are totally independent of an outside body. We see ourselves as part and parcel of the BBC, and we work within the same sort of philosophy, the same sort of framework uh, as the rest of the BBC. Some of the feedback we get from the audience is really heartwarming. Three years ago, we ran a competition. One of the runners-up was a very elderly lady who said, could you please send me some color biros, which we did. Several weeks ago, we had a letter from a girl of nine who says, my grandmother won this competition. She received some colored biros from you. These were meant for me. I can now read and write. This is just to tell you thank you very much. If we've got uh, six million listeners, every sixth poll listens to us on a regular basis, we can't be bad. We are the BBC, as far as your average listener in Poland is concerned. BBC's reputation is us. You're all set for the world at six. Stand by, Tim. On you now. Oh, hello? A reputation based on more than contemporary happenings. This is Todd Lux McGillan here. Why did I get that fight grand in one hour? It's curtain for you. We broadcast entertainment programmes. Now, you'll be surprised in how many countries the Goon Show is popular. How they understand it, I do not know, but they apparently like it just the same. My husband's just been shot. I've just come into the front room and found him lying on the carpet there. Oh, is he dead? I think so. Oh, hadn't you better make sure? All right, just a minute. He's dead. <laughs> We also broadcast drama from Radio 4. Well, we have our own drama unit who also make uh, plays here. And that is also very popular. Because I think, you see, this is all part and parcel of conveying, in a service with a lot of time on the air, the full richness, if you like, of our cultural life here and our entertainment life. Hello, this is Margaret Howard with another edition of Letterbox. And our first correspondent this week has sent one of our own letter headings back to us. I think it was our special anniversary symbol that caught his eye. BBC External Services attains 50 years of broadcasting this year. What is the actual date and what will you be doing to mark the half century? H.A.L. Francis, Antigua. 
The first transmission was on December the 19th, 1932, Mr. Francis. And as December the 19th falls on a Sunday this year, we'll be celebrating the actual day with a Thanksgiving service from St. Martin in the Fields. We'll also be broadcasting a special concert from the Royal Albert Hall on November the 24th. And there'll be a 45-minute feature programme about external broadcasting in general and our place in the pattern, plus several other schemes which you'll be hearing all about when they're fully matured. I suppose I'm here in, in charge of the replies, and um, my style is somewhat acerbic, I think, in this programme. And the listeners rather like that. I get letters from all over the world. I mean, even in today's programme, we had a pretty good spread. There were letters from Antigua, Israel, Malaysia, New Zealand, USA, and Trinidad. And because the programme's been going for so long, the listeners who write in are used to the style. And they write in a way that expects me to answer them back fairly brusquely. Why, oh why, does World Service broadcast A, Meridian at 11.30 GMT on Saturday, with a repeat at 23.30, B, Play of the Week at midnight 30, followed by Baker's Half Dozen and Repeat, both at 11.30 on Sunday, C, the other editions of Meridian at 23.30 GMT on Tuesdays and Thursdays, with a repeat at 11.30 the following day. By broadcasting Meridian at 12 hourly intervals, you've robbed me of a precious hour and a half of listening time. Rapid calculations show that 11.30 and 23.30 GMT are 7.30 morning and evening in Trinidad. So I do see that your peak listening times are rather dominated by the same programmes. But I'm afraid it's impossible to organise a schedule that gives the maximum number of people all over the world a chance to hear the maximum number of programmes without giving some of them the same programme twice. Oh, they're a lovely audience. I think uh, an overseas audience is a little bit more appreciative of what they get because they have to make that much more of an effort to actually hear us. You know, it's quite difficult to tune in. We have some uh, people who write very regularly indeed. We have a couple in Brazil way up the Amazon, the Littles, Mr and Mrs Little. Now, I think they're probably missionaries, I'm not sure, but they are in a very remote area and their letters come in batches every three months and they send them by canoe and so that we get a whole heap of letters from them. But actually I haven't heard from them for some time, so Penny Turk and I, the producer, are getting a bit worried about them. We're afraid they might have ended up in some cannibal's pot somewhere. This tranquil setting masks the ears of the BBC external services. Within this building, broadcasts from all over the world are intercepted, recorded, translated, transcribed, and analyzed. For this is Cavisham House near Reading, home of the BBC's monitoring service. Listening in is one of the cheapest and most effective ways of obtaining worldwide information. Linda Eberst is monitoring supervisor. We monitor Radio Moscow 24 hours a day. We have to listen every minute of the day to the radio, so we are watching it constantly. We know when news bulletins come, we know which one of the major ones, and so we listen primarily to the bullet, news bulletins. From Moscow alone come six radio channels, all of which have to be separately monitored. In addition, other Iron Curtain countries are constantly listened to and analyzed for even the slightest change in government policy or national mood. Western Europe stations are also followed. So too are those in North Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere in this troubled world. In times of crisis, very often the radio is the only source of news. For example, when martial law was imposed in Poland on December the 13th, Correspondents were unable to get their dispatches out. Radio telephone links had been disconnected. So we were the only source for news.
Monitors get to know their radios very, very well. They get to know the broadcasters, the newsreaders. There is one Moscow announcer called Levitan who always announces important changes of deaths. Monitors will recognize that when they hear him cut his voice on the air, they know something important is going to happen. We certainly get many world scoops. The best example happened in 1962 when the monitoring service was used as a hotline between the two superpowers. The Cuban crisis had the world hovering on the brink of a nuclear war caused by the installation of missiles in Cuba. The Moscow radio broadcast a message from Khrushchev in Russian to Kennedy announcing the dismantling of the missiles. This message was translated immediately and its gist was passed to the White House at once. Kennedy, when he acknowledged the message, said he was replying immediately to the broadcast, though he had not yet received the official text. And that led to the diffusing of the crisis, and we were acknowledged. Very proud of that. I have uh, today been informed by Chairman Khrushchev that all of the IL-28 bombers now in Cuba will be withdrawn in 30 days. Other scoops have been the invasion of Hungary, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, the Iranian hostage crisis. During the whole of that crisis, especially towards the end, we were one of the only sources of information for the Americans. And the listening room was besieged by American film crews with their cameras waiting for the monitor to type out the snap that the hostages had been released. News like that is but one part of the vast intake of information gathered at Cavisham. It all becomes available in printed form to whomever wants it. Some information goes by a much less public method. This is a telephone computer link to the American government, for example. Right, you play from the beginning, right? Yeah, okay. Good. The Winter's Tale by William Shakespeare. Music composed by David Timpson. Well, those announcements will cut, won't they? Mm -hmm. We'll come in clean on the music yeah. there. I don't know if the studio atmos is over the start of the music. The transcription services are that part of the BBC's external services which export BBC radio programmes to broadcasters all over the world for transmission on their networks, on their frequencies. We present... My Music. So BBC programmes are transferred from tape to disc for distribution around the world. Disc is preferred because hundreds of overseas clients are small broadcasting concerns, in some cases operated by just one person. But what is the kind of program they want to buy? Some programs, curiously enough, cross all the boundaries. And very high on this list, sometimes surprisingly, comes comedy. It's one of the most popular comedy shows that we've ever had. It was The Clithero Kid. Now, I believe that the Clithero Kid did more for British influence and British reputation in Africa than the Overseas Food Corporation ever did. As well as programs from the past, anything you hear on radio today is likely to be rebroadcast across the world, profitably in both the economic and aesthetic sense. Although the money for the transcription service has been reduced by half through government cuts, it still has a large library of radio material organized with one aim in mind. Our objective is to get the maximum exposure for what we believe to be the best radio programs in the world on other people's air. If it disappears, we'll be replaced by the voices of other people, and not necessarily friends of ours. It's me, DLT, trying to get out on our BBC Wild Service programme known as A Jolly Good Show. Um, I've got one of those lightning letters now, and uh, you can tell what sort of letter it's going to be. Hi, DLT, how are you? I'm mad, so please play. Status quo's rock and roll four, and here we go. Michael Moffat. Radio Michael One Delta, disc jockeys USA, such as Dave Taylor, Lee Travis Jersey, are as well known on the world service as they are on domestic radio. The pattern, of course, Hedis remains the same. Bai Saba in Israel, Guilla Rial of Luxembourg, uh, Paul George of Kerala, India, Dr. Troyal of Algeria, Zanya Rahman of Malaysia, and Tom Murphy of Jersey City, USA. Oh. Well, I got that lot out. I think I'll get the record out for you, too. It is indeed rock and roll from Status Quo. Rock and roll in every song. 
I think that uh, pop is important, um, not simply because of its entertainment value, not simply because it is uh, exposing British entertainment product, which actually brings a lot of money back into this country, but also because it means that the service will have an appeal to young people. Okay, now we come to Ed Basniak from Cleveland, Ohio, USA, who said, I've only recently discovered the delights of shortwave radio and your show in particular, so how about a request for me? Well, that's a pleasure. No problem, Ed. It's coming up for you next. While in these disturbances, and clear said me for Jim White, which was a wicked and a bully like me, and them was occupied. Me shirt in me left and me pants on the right. I think it's rude. I'm not sure about that, but I think it's rude. It's called Your Honour, and it's from Pluto, uh, whose second name is Shervington, if that means anything to you. Are you selling just an image of Britain, or are you selling some practical points about Britain? Are you trying to make money for Britain at times? We are selling Britain in the sense that we do a lot of programmes talking about what's happening in this country. And of course, there are some people here, among government and elsewhere, who are somewhat perturbed at times that we talk about strikes as well as our successes. But we believe that if you don't tell the truth about your own country, when you tell the truth about somebody else's, they're not going to believe you. Over the years, these specifically BBC Russian service, became a tremendous authority. It built up a tremendous reputation of something very objective, impartial. And if they say so, everybody would believe. So because of it, I knew several cases, while still in Soviet Union, of people being released just because their cases were reported on the Russian service of BBC as being un uh, unjust. Virtually everybody listened to it because that's so important in a country where the information is tempered with, and everybody knows it is a lie, it is propaganda. Bukowski's remarks about tampering with the truth could apply to any authoritarian regime. In China, however, restrictions have been relaxed in recent years. And the BBC has discovered that the impact of its own programs to the East has been substantial. Before the change, the political change in China, we got 33 letters in that particular year. Two years later, after the political changes, uh, we, reached, uh, we reached a figure of 33,000. And the figure for last year was about 25,000. It's gone down very slightly. Dear Xu Ke listener, Thank you very much for the beautiful calendar and the calligraphy. On behalf of all the members of the Chinese section, I'd like to thank you. What is interesting is, of course, that the Chinese authorities now are encouraging people to listen to foreign broadcasts and to particularly to the BBC because they want them to learn English. It is not the domestic license payer but the government at Westminster that finances the BBC's external services to the tune of 62 million pounds a year. But if he who pays the piper does call the tune, is the BBC obliged to broadcast government propaganda, no matter how subtle it might be? I think that some people in parts of the world cannot fully appreciate that an organization which is financed by government money nevertheless is editorially free. The government is able to do two things. It is able, in a sense, in exchange for that money, which comes from the taxpayer, to tell us in what languages we should broadcast and for how long. Apart from that, however, they have no control over us whatsoever. It's for the very reason that we are not a propaganda service that we regretted so bitterly some of the cuts that were made by the government last year. Particularly, I'm thinking of the ending of the Spanish service and the Italian service, because we believe profoundly that to cease to broadcast your friends and only to concentrate on countries which you might describe as your enemies gives you the image of a propaganda service. And that, of course, is precisely what we are not and do not wish to be. 
Our next, a bulletin of world news. And then in commentary after the news, Frank Barber looks at the implications of the proposed Israeli withdrawal from Sinai. That's in commentary after the news, which is coming up now in just half a minute. Ici Londres, service français de la BBC. Au micro, Patrick Gérard. As far as the French service to Europe is concerned, that is to say essentially to France and Belgium, we have been cut by half. Un stade critique. Selon un communiqué très ferme de l'agence Chine Nouvelle, les ventes d'armes américaines à Taïwan ont placé la Chine dans une situation délicate, car elles témoignent... I would almost say that you, you should broadcast to your friends above all, friendship needs nourishment. And it's probably more important to talk to members of your family than to talk to strangers. And certainly, in this case, we are talking to the people who have been our neighbors and will continue to be our neighbors for a long time. And I doubt whether Britain can be indifferent to what goes on on the other side of the channel. Furthermore, uh, we are now members of, of a European community where the other members are in a position to influence uh, the very standard of living in this country by decisions taken or vetoed in Brussels. Britain has different viewpoints and it is vital that they should be explained. And if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for us. The charge of propaganda or even a viewpoint explained can never be leveled more fiercely than at any medium's news output. At the BBC's newsroom in Bush House, work on the technical and editorial sides continues 24 hours a day. The World Service broadcasts a news bulletin in English on the hour. In addition, they also broadcast in-depth programs such as Radio Newsreel. The BBC have correspondents throughout the world covering everything from high politics, to sport. So this one's called South Africa Cricket. Uh, the president of the Supreme Council for Sport in Africa, comma, Mr. Abraham Bordia, O-R-D-I-A, comma, has said Africans will take a very serious view of the decision of English international cricketers to tour South Africa this month. He said Africa would have to look at the issue very carefully. The unofficial England The newsroom is one of the biggest uh, newsrooms in the world. Uh, we have 110 journalists. They work three shifts a day, taking us right throughout the 24 hours. And we produce something like 250 news bulletins. Uh, one million words a day flood into that newsroom. And the job of the newsroom is, in fact, to process that material. And you have to throw most of it away, of course. And we're left with the major international stories of the day. The news comes from many sources. We have the major international news agencies, Reuters, Agence France Presse, Associated Press, United Press International, and they're turning out material 24 hours a day. We have the monitoring service at Caversham, which is very important and helps enormously. And we have more than 20 full-time staff foreign correspondents in the major capitals of the world. And on top of that, we've got 300 part-time correspondents, and they're scattered throughout the globe as well. And their job is to alert us when news is breaking in their area, uh, and then we ask, we tell them what we want them to do. But ultimately, when we get a news yeah, item, we first of all satisfy ourselves that the information we've got is accurate. And then one of our lead writing chief sub-editors will dictate his story to a typist. That is then checked by his duty editor, and is again checked by the senior duty editor. And if the item is important enough, we simply go into the studio, very quietly of course, and drop the item in front of a rather startled newsreader. And he then reads it without having seen it before. But they're very good at that. Leader, General Yaruzelsky has begun talks in Moscow with President Brezhnev. It's General Yaruzelsky's first visit to the Soviet Union since the imposition of martial law two and a half months ago. When he Radio Newsreel is a very popular program. It contains usually five or six voice reports from various parts of the globe. Uh, and these can be uh, anything from Yaruzelsky meeting Brezhnev to the Russian soft landing on Venus. We can, in fact, take reports from foreign correspondents while the program is actually on the air. Um, people have to move a bit quickly with the razor and so on, but uh, yes, we, we often do that. Isn't it? OK, tape 073. Duration 54. Are you doing the headlines? No, I think you're doing the headlines, yes? 
sorry to interrupt you doing them. You like headlines, yeah. thanks. Newsroom, we are preparing some new stories at the moment. Uh, we're reading South Africa cricket, turning it around on a hostile reaction from Australia. Hello, Alex. Do? You're doing a piece for The Real Now, are you? I can get something in the next 15 minutes, I will, but don't expect anything. <laughs> there have been previous soft landings by Russian space vehicles. We're reading Israel Lebanon on Venus. So, but this latest story on Israel mission um, was, uh, was given high priority. Was given priority on Moscow radio. Ian Hall is doing a wrap-up on this for uh, us. No, uh, and we can use the material put over for our own news. Of the right, thank you. space landing on Venus. 15 hours, Greenwich Mean Time. BBC World Service presents Radio Newsreel. This is a very short insert, isn't it? This is just the actuality we're playing now, and then we'll have our correspondent, our science correspondent after that, uh, James Wilkinson. Okay, we're taking him all the way to the end, uh, and he'll announce himself out, okay? It's been announced in Moscow that an unmanned Soviet spacecraft has successfully landed on Venus. It's reported to have transmitted color pictures of the planet's surface and taken soil samples. The Soviet authorities say another craft is due to land on Venus on Friday. There have been previous soft landings by Russian space vehicles on Venus, but this latest mission was given priority on Moscow radio. Soviet interplanetary station Venera 13 reached Venus early in the day. Its descent module has soft landed on a mountain plateau about two kilometers high. I don't think people in this country, the mass majority of them, have any idea what it is like to live under a totalitarian regime, where every broadcast you hear, every, every television uh, program you see, every newspaper you pick up, you're not reading the truth. You're being given a version of the truth uh, which is controlled by that government. And in fact, you are being misinformed about what is happening in your own country as well as what is happening elsewhere in the world. Vladimir Bukowski, no stranger to Soviet jails, would agree. Primarily, the Soviet media is a propaganda exercise, and it is quite openly called so. It is uh, under the control of a propaganda department of Central Committee. And nothing could be reported or printed unless uh, it is approved from these quarters. So most of the people would be listening to it to know what is happening in the world. But then, of course, uh, it is also important to know what is happening in your own country, because uh, we will probably know more about what happens in Latin America while sitting in Moscow than about what happens in the next town or even in the next street. The Polish leader, General Jaruzelski, is visiting Moscow for the first time since he imposed martial law in December. In Zimbabwe, the information minister has said that Mr. Joshua Nkomo had a meeting in 1980 with South African generals to seek their support for a coup. The minister said the generals rejected Mr. Nkomo's request. There are other competitors, of course, in the world, many of them now. Particularly at the top of the list are uh, Radio Moscow and The Voice of America. They both, as organizations, get far more money than we do. They broadcast much longer hours. For example, Radio Moscow broadcasts in more languages than we do, far more. And they actually broadcast for 2,000 hours a week, as opposed to us now at 700 hours a week. The Voice of America broadcasts 1,900 hours a week. We are about sixth in the league table, the world broadcasters at the moment, in terms of the number of hours we broadcast. As far as the impact is concerned, however, there is no doubt at all that all our audience research and the audience research of other countries, which is important, does show that we are still ahead of the field. We do enjoy a regular audience every day of 100 million listeners. Uh, in fact, people, the people of most walks of life would listen to it. The ordinary people would listen to it because they may pick up news about uh, increases in prices in Soviet Union, which are coming, and not reported in the Soviet press. The 
intellectuals would listen because they would have more information of intellectual life outside and the reaction of world to different affairs. Even the rulers would listen to it quite attentively because that's also important for them to know what happens in their own country. Even the prison guards in our prison would listen to that and the officers because that's important for them. If any of our complaints get out to the free world and got reported on BBC, that means for them that the sort of a reviewing commission can, can uh, uh, arrive any moment to prison and make a certain ex inspection of the events. And I, I'm pretty sure that the government itself would listen, and there are some stories about it. And I remember in 1970 uh, when Solzhenitsyn got Nobel Prize for Literature, and a friend of mine who happened to know Nikita Khrushchev at that time, at that time already a retired and a pensioner, not a ruler, but still. Uh, so he called uh, over, the, over the phone to Khrushchev and asked him what he thinks about the news. And Khrushchev said, oh, yes, oh, yeah. do you mean Solzhenitsyn? Yes, I've heard it on BBC. I'm listening on BBC all the news now. Uh, so that was a sudden confirmation that even retired Nikita Khrushchev was listening to it. I believe that in any other country in the world, if they possessed an organization like the BBC and the BBC's external services in particular, they would not be taking money away from it from time to time. They would be pouring money into it. They would be so grateful to have an organization of this kind with the reputation that it has and the enormous impact that it has. Before we leave tonight, here are some personal messages for our friends in the Falkland Islands. For all relatives and friends of Mrs. Heather Fielding, the message is, thinking of you, hope you're all safe and well. God bless all our love, Heather, Johnny and Joanna. Mr. and Mrs. C. Maddox of Flawton in Wirral are asking us to include two messages. The first is for Mrs. Porter and family and all our relations and friends in the Falklands. Thinking of you all, it says, our love and blessings. And then one for Robert Maddox. Thinking of you and hoping to see you soon, our love and blessings, Mum, Dad, Carol and Una.